Thank you. It's now my honor to introduce you to today's speakers, speaker, Ifigenia Castamonidi, um, or Ifi, as we call her. She has, a been, she has been a member of the Theosophical Society in Greece since 1995. She was secretary for 10 years, editor of the Theosophical Publishing House in Greece, and the Greek Theosophical Magazine Elisos for over 20 years and has translated many classical theosophical books into Greek language. She has traveled to many countries professionally as an air hostess, and also individually meeting people and getting acquainted with their cultures. She has three children and three grandchildren and lives in Athens, Greece. And I must add that lately she has been living also in England and Greece. <laughs> well, so, back and forth. <laughs> yeah. Welcome <laughs> once again. And uh, let me pass the word to Iphigenia. Thank you very much, Erika. And uh, thank you all of you who are here uh, for this presentation. Uh, let me share my uh, PowerPoint. If I can manage, <laughs> there it is. Okay, I'll start with the first one. All right. The Franz Hartmann collection of volume five, Dr. Franz Hartmann in the Theosophist. This volume five amounts to 460 pages, there are many, and contains 53 different items articles, letters to the editor, his own comments on articles by various writers, official reports, correspondence, and many others. Hartmann used to sign his articles, etc., in different ways, some with his full name, Franz Hartmann, or his initials, FH, or just H, and others with a pen name, such as American Buddhist, or with the initials AB and MD. Volume five starts with editor's preface, that is Erica. Then follows the frontispiece and a very informative description of it, written by Hartmann himself. The same frontispiece is found in all Hartmann's books published by the European School of Theosophy, as already mentioned by Erica last time. Next comes a brief introduction to the life and works of Franz Hartmann, MD, by Robert Hutwall, while Hartmann's autobiography, written in 1906, can be found in the appendix on page 425 and after. From this piece, and there we go to Hartmann himself. As we know, Franz Hartmann was a Bavarian-born doctor of medicine, a surgeon ophthalmologist, to be more specific, with a broad interest in literature. In 1882, he joined the Theosophical Society in America, and a year later, he traveled to India, where he settled in Nadia headquarters. He started writing for the Theosophist in 1883. His first entry, written in January 1883, while still living in Colorado, USA, was published in the May issue of the same year. It was not an article, but a letter to the editor, Elena Blavatsky, about Deva Chan, a subject that still puzzles and confuses all of us who are trying to understand this state of consciousness, which occurs after physical death. In it, along with other things, he asks, open quote, how can a conscious existence in Devacha without activity or pursuit be one of satisfaction or enjoyment? Please explain, close quote. His second entry, titled Reason and Intuition, was also a long letter to the editor, Blavatsky, with more questions on the same subject, Deva Chan, written in June 1883 and published in September of the same year. 
Other letters to the editor follow, which were all answered extensively by Elena Blavatsky. More letters to the editor can be found in this volume written by different people to which Hartmann replies himself and comments on. The first of his articles now has the title, My Experiences. In it, he describes his personal encounter with, open quote, letters appearing from the air, from thin air, close quote, or letters coming from the masters and addressed to members of the Theosophical Society of that time. Other articles follow on several subjects, such as occult phenomena, magnetism, medicine and therapies according to occultism, astrological incidents of his life that came out true, etc. <clears throat> One can read its inauguration speech delivered to new ideologies. Sorry, if you can stop because I had a call that I had a call. Sorry about that. Dr. Hartman, <coughs> I'm sorry about that. Dr. Hartman was an open minded person and a researcher of esotericism, following the second object of the Theosophical Society. He had a profound knowledge on Christian mysticism, and this is demonstrated by many of his articles. For example, the cosmogony of the Old Testament, a very interesting presentation he did, dealing with so many obscure things we usually come across, especially in the book of Genesis, which, about which he writes. Open quote. If the Christian translators of the Hebrew Bible had been more conversant with the Hebrew language and with the occult meaning of Hebrew words, they would perhaps have translated it differently. Close quotes. And then he starts explaining those dark and confusing passages of the Bible. The same spirit follows his articles, Theosophy and Christianity accompanied by his reply to a letter by E.C. to the editor regarding this article. We can also read his article, The Personal Jesus, his comments on the religion of Christianity and modern Christianity in regard with, open quote, two important documents which illustrate so well the difference between the doctrines of the Christian religion and the way by which these doctrines are carried out by the professed followers of Christ." Close quote. We were about uh, his article, Yoga Practice in the Roman Catholic Church, which deals with the use of spiritual exercises of Ignatius de Loyola. While the um, one, the other article on Buddhistic symbols and ceremonies in the Roman Catholic Church is accompanied by a nice image illustrating the descent of the Logos, the one you see here. It's from uh, the book, which in Christian symbology is symbolized by a luminous radiating globe, globe as he writes. These uh, last two articles on Christianity, the Roman Catholic Church and the Buddhistic symbols, um, are quite long and they present the many similarities among religions as well as traditions. They show how much more a student can acquire by being open-minded as Hartmann was and thus find knowledge and truth or truths everywhere in all scriptures all traditions, all religions. Volume five includes if official reports on various events in different places and book reviews written by Hartmann, such, such as the one on the inhabitants of the planet written by Carl Deprel, 
the one on Kuthumi unveiled, written by Arthur Lilly, on a small pamphlet under the title The Government and the Buddhists in Ceylon, written by the Roman Catholics at Colombo against Buddhists, on Mr. Gribble's pamphlet about the Coulomb incident and others. There is also a book review written by Anna Ballard on one of Hartman's books titled The Life and Doctrine of Jacob Beme, 1891. This last one is under the process of being typed and published by the European School of Theosophy. Perhaps next year, Erika knows better. A strange kind of article, which included a reprint from the newspaper Madras Mail, had been published in October 1884. It seemed as if someone had tried to implicate Hartmann in the Gulob incident. Its title, the title of this uh, article, is A Forged Theosophical Letter, and in volume five, it is on page 129. Both Olcott and Hartmann comment on and reply to it. On page 345, we find an article, or rather a prospectus, called Constitution, Rules and Regulations for the Organizers of the Lay Convent in Switzerland. This had been published in the supplement of the Theosophist, November 1888. It is about a place of refuge, as Hartmann calls it, which he endeavored to establish in Europe, a society in itself, by itself, and for itself, as he writes. Now, comments by an anonymous, anonymous say, if successful, it will doubtless do much to spread an interest in mysticism among the more sensitive and refined classes, and afford a welcome shelter to those who shrink from the rude and cruel elbowings of life. However, since then, there had not been any more information available about this uh, project. Hartmann was extremely interested in psychic powers. He was a prolific writer and researcher of the unseen with an intense interest in the etheric words and entities, the other planes and the latent powers in humans and nature the study of which is strongly recommended in the third object of the Theosophical Society. So, in this volume, besides two articles on occult phenomena, we find a very interesting one, which he titles An Interview with a German. In it, he writes about a long and meaningful conversation with someone, open quote, whose figure was youthful and strong. His face expressed knowledge and happiness. His eyes seemed to penetrate into the innermost depths of my soul, of close quote. Now, his article on occultism in Germany is about the necessity of practical work, while the one titled A Theosophical Fable is written as a kind of humorous parody about theosophists. Both articles under the titles Clairvoyant medical diagnosis and psychometric experiences refer to clairvoyant persons and their abilities. A very interesting drawing of a temple accompanies the second one. It's this. <clears throat> Done psychometrically by the clairvoyant woman Hartmann was interviewing when she touched a certain letter, perhaps um, sent by Mahatma. One of his articles is titled The Dweller of the, Th of the Threshold. In it, he calls our attention on alchemy, which, I open quote, by the majority of mankind is looked upon as an array of vagaries, extravagancies, and superstitions, close quote. Who is the dweller of the threshold, he asks. This dweller meets us in many shapes, and then by an informative and clarifying approach, he explains 
this so obscure to many of us subject. We also read articles such as the five creative powers in the universe and the inner life, in which he compares the 25 letters of the English alphabet to the 25 compound elements of tattvas, according to Sankaracharya's teachings. Among others, he also analyzes the correspondence of sound to the Hebrew letters. In his article, The Dangers of Occultism, he points out how easy it can become for every researcher to be led astray by misunderstanding the theosophical and occult teachings. And in his article, A Forgotten Mystic and Occultist, he writes about John Portage, the life and ideas of a celebrated mystic of the 16th century, as he calls him. Hartman's admiration towards Elena Blavatsky was great. And this can be clearly seen in his article about her under the title, Elena Blavatsky, the Messenger of the White Lodge, which was published in the April 1909 issue. Also in his autobiography, reprinted from the magazine, The Oakland Review, January 1908. Now, three very long treatise-like articles are included in volume five. The first one is on Rosicrucian letters, which Hartmann translated from German. It was published in seven installments, July to December, 1887. Each one of these installments deals with a different subject given according to the Rosicrucian teachings. So we read about divine wisdom, the practical way to approach the light, truth absolute and relative, the secret doctrine, the addicts, personal experiences, and the brothers, with uh, which he says is an extract from an occult letter of 1801. Wise words we read in that part, in the part one of the installments called the abducts that we should consider carefully. Today's world is so swept away in materialism that words like this are necessary to guard us from being influenced by this materialism. Extremely interesting, I would say, is the installment called personal experience, which proves beyond any doubt the axiom, open quote, when the pupil is ready, the master will appear, close quote. There are many ways in which such a teacher may appear to a person when the time is ripe. And here, in this volume, in this uh, long article, we find a representative paradigm that one should read carefully. Open quote. It was in the summer of 1787, when I was sitting upon one of the banks in the public gardens near the Berg Castle at Munich, Bavaria, and thinking deeply about the subject, the master and the teacher, the, the, the teacher and the pupil. When I noticed a stranger of a dignified and imposing aspect, but in unpretentious clothing promenading upon the graveled walk, there was something about him which attracted my attention. On well, the next day, at about the same hour, I went again to that place, hoping to meet the stranger again. He was there, sitting upon a bank and reading a book. Close quote. And the text goes on by describing how the conversation started between the two and all that happened afterwards with the strange man who proved to be the teacher while the narrator, his pupil. The second long treatise like article published in 12 installments this time, 1884-1885, demonstrates the extending, his extending knowledge on theosophy and occultism. It is titled Practical Instructions for Students of Occultism. These instructions will be found most valuable as a help towards the practical realization of the sublime truths that have been given out in various books. Thus, we read about 
freedom, the power of will, the development of will, knowledge, the forbidden fruit, imagination, intuition, the real and the unreal, man, the twofold action of the law of karma on the various planes, consciousness and ideation. All of this presented according to the theosophical and alcohol teachings. Finally, the third long treatise-like article is a very interesting and intriguing one, an actual book of the 18th century, also translated by him from German and published in the Theosophy 1884 in seven installments. It is called Magicon or the secret system of a society of unknown philosophers. The instructions including in it were based on Martinez Pasquales, the founder of the sect of the Martinists and his disciple, Louis Claude or Marquis de Saint Martin. They contain a lot of information on that mystic society and its teachings and are very useful for those of us who do not know much about it, me included, obviously. They also contain many extraordinary ideas, which, although they may not, may not appear new to the theosophist, are nevertheless interesting to the lovers of occult lore. In them, we find references on clair clairvoyance, psychometry, and a satisfactory explanation of the occult meaning of numbers and mathematics. Volume five includes, uh, concludes with an obituary written by Anne Be by Annie Besant and published in October, 1912 after Hartmann's passing in August of the same year. And we have the plug in front of his house. Then follows an extract from a letter to Franz Hartmann in Master's KH handwriting dating 1884, which Zinara Yadasa published in the Theosophy, September 1933. Volume five of the Franz Hartmann collection ends with his autobiography in the appendix on page 425 and after, in which he describes interesting incidents of his life, he experiences during his travels and alongside Elena Blavatsky, Henry Olcott, William Judge, and others. Nice photos of several places are incorporated into the appendix, picturing places that he had, he had visited during his travels. Also, a funny caricature on page 443 called The Initiation, drawn by Elena Blavatsky herself, whose open quote, sense of humor was very great and she loved to make sport of even her closest friends, close quote. In a few words, volume five is an important collection of Franz Hartmann's articles and other items. Very useful to all researchers in esotericism. It, is said, it certainly adds and completes his work in books as well other writings one can find in theosophical magazines of his time. For example, in the German Lotus Bluten, which he inaugurated, the British Lucifer, and in the path of the American section to mention some of them. Thank you for listening. And sorry about my cough. <laughs>